Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at this review copy I was sent of Do Not Let Us Die in the Dark Night of This Cold Winter, which is a little mini game created for really any fantasy role playing game. And it's intended to be played between sessions um, during winter in your campaign. It's a way to have the PCs um, try and protect a village during a particularly horrific winter and trying to get as many NPCs to survive as possible. So it's a little strategy and resource management game, essentially. I have the hardback version here. Um, it's print on demand from DriveThruRPG. As usual, I will put links down in the description below where you can get it yourself. And it is written, and all the art is done by Cecil Howe, who is also the creator of HexKit, which is a really fantastic uh, DM tool for creating hex maps that I've reviewed previously. Starts off with a quote from Cormac McCarthy, which tells you that this is a very arty book. Even the title, um, which is ridiculously long, is intentionally reminiscent of the titles from post-rock bands, right? The kinds of song titles that those bands tend to have. It's very long and flowery and poetic. I kind of dig it. So basically, the idea is that it works for any fantasy role-playing game. So as long as you have characters that can roughly fit into uh, magic, fighting, and thievery, you just sort of sort them into those three categories, because those are the roles that they're going to be taking on while playing out this session. There are some good examples of how you can set this up, um, depending on the campaign that you're in, uh, the type of village that it's going to be, like good names for it, some possible hooks that you can use to lure the players in. And there's even some information at the back in case you are running the type of game where surviving a winter wouldn't be a big deal. Perhaps your characters are so powerful that that's not really a concern. He has some advice for ways to make it a concern. So basically how the game works is that there's a number of turns um, over the course of a winter. It's 10 or more. There's a way of randomizing it. And over the course of each turn, uh, you're going to have a bunch of houses. Each player is going to be in charge of a house that's going to have like five or so people in it. And every turn, the people are going to need to eat. They're going to need to have medicine because some of them are going to get randomly sick. And they're going to need to have fuel to keep their houses warm. And when this doesn't happen, you're going to be marking off little trackers. I'll show you here at the back what we have. These little trackers here tracking the different people in each house, depending on how sick they are. Um, there's three boxes here for how sick they are and two boxes for if they are hungry or not. And if they don't get their needs met, then they're going to die. So you need to manage all of your resources carefully. And there's a good deal of strategy put into this um, because when you go out to search for resources, basically you have to decide whether your group is going to be searching for uh, firewood or for food or for medicine. Um, and that you're going to get mostly that stuff, but the different types of players are going to specialize in different things. So um, if you're sending out a bunch of fighters, then they're going to be able to get more fuel. If you're sending out more rogues, they're going to get more food and more magic type people are going to be able to get more medicine. So your whole group's going to get a bunch of the one thing that you decided to get. But then depending on the composition of the group that you send out, they're going to get a few of the other things too, based on their specialty. And so as a result, what's going to happen is that over the course of the game, you're eventually going to start getting low on a couple different things, but you're going to have to decide to strategically go out and just get one resource, and hopefully you get enough to fill your other needs. Uh, for example, every, during every turn, you're going to roll a die to determine how, um, how cold it is, and that's going to determine how much fuel you're going to need. So that's going to vary, and it's not going to be predictable. Of course, your villagers are going to be eating up your food at a pretty steady rate, and also they're going to be randomly getting ill and the illness is going to progress over time. However, it's set up so that no matter how hungry a NPC is, if you give them one dose of food, then they're not hungry anymore. And similarly, if they're uh, no matter how sick they are, if they get some medicine, they're automatically healed. So there's going to be some strategic management where should I give him the medicine now or maybe I can hold off wait until he gets a little bit sicker and then give him medicine because that'll be a more efficient use of the medicine there's interesting uh, strategic decisions to be made. And here's where the real meat of it is. Um, you're going to be rolling random encounters or random occurrences uh, for each turn. And that's going to throw a bunch of different uh, twists and turns into what's going on. Of course, most of these are bad, but occasionally you get a really good one. 
Um, in general, though, it's uh, another level of entropy draining your resources and making things more difficult and forcing you to make harder and harder choices as the plan that you came up with, which seems so foolproof, suddenly takes a left turn because of a crazy uh, random occurrence. For example, in a fit of grief, one of the villagers has taken all of the available medicine to a villager stricken with illness. The sick villager has died from an overdose as a result. So you lose all of the medicine and you lose a villager, right? You didn't see it coming, but people are unpredictable. We have this really excellent quick reference here. Now, the one of the main criticisms I would have, it's not really a big criticism, is that why I would have liked to see this quick reference uh, closer to the beginning of the book. Because most of the text of the book is him going through each of these different uh, steps and the setup and so on. But because each of the explanations is uh, fairly in-depth, you don't really get a sense of the big picture, how it all fits together, until you read this quick reference, which really has it all on one page. So I would have liked to see that a bit earlier in the book, so I would have a big picture idea and then start digging into how every step works. It's not really a big deal, though. We have some handouts that you can print. Um, this is the storeroom worksheet that the GM runs, where you keep track of uh, the main different resources that you have and the population and the current temperature and so on. And each player gets uh, this little sheet for their house tracking their villagers. There's other little strategic decisions that you can make as well. For example, if enough uh, NPCs die, it can be a good idea to conglomerate people together combine two houses in order to conserve heat because now you only have to heat one house instead of the two houses before. But whenever you do that, you have to pay extra food to move all the people because it's so exhausting doing this whole big move. So there's these trade-offs you have to take into account. So it's very much a uh, co-op game, right? So the, the DM is part of it, really. He's in there talking to the players and working things through. Uh, everything is randomly generated. There aren't a lot of like calls that really have to be made by a referee type character. So it can be a good way for the game master to play with the players this little co-op survival game. And we have some advanced ideas. For example, if your players are extremely powerful, you could do something like set this in another dimension or in a magical snow globe, some way to keep them actually invested in working through the game and not just using magic to you know solve their way out of it or teleport the whole village to another dimension or something like that. Uh, we can just, you can play it simply as a board game. So this game could definitely be played on its own. You don't have to play it as part of the downtime or as a, a side mission in between uh, missions in an RPG. You can just play this as a game itself, right? It's a fully fledged uh, co-op game. It has lots of cool little scenery descriptions that you can use to inject some color into the occurrences. You can create, of course, custom occurrence tables depending on where you want to set this, if you want to play it somewhere else in another setting. And he gives you advice on how to do that while not unbalancing the game. A couple other rules, including a way to randomly generate uh, a map of the village using die drop tables, which is pretty neat. And ways to scale the difficulty up or down, depending on how good you are at the game. So we have a lot of these uh, neat little tiles here that you can print and cut out. And there's rules for randomly generating what the village looks like, or you can just use them uh, in your own game to create your own village. We got some little lakes and paths and so on. And there we go. That's it. It's quite a straightforward little game, but it seems very well placed, very well play tested, very well designed. And it seems like it would be a lot of fun and a nice break from a normal RPG. One of the fun things about D&D in general is that it's so flexible and that you can sort of do these little side mini games every once in a while to break up the monotony of doing the same sort of thing over and over. So I really like this idea. And from what I understand, he's actually writing a sequel that I think is going to be set like in the fall, like he's going to do one of these for each season, which seems like a really cool idea to me. Any case, that's my review for Do Not Let Us Die in the Dark Night of This Cold Winter. Uh, definitely check it out. I would at least get the PDF version because uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to print out and you don't really have to have the physical book to run this. The rules are fairly straightforward. But I will put links down in the description below where you can check it out yourself. And stay tuned for my next review next week where I'm planning to do uh, the, another book by James Raji, which is the monolith from beyond time and space, which is going to be a Lovecraftian uh, cosmic horror RPG that James Raji wrote. I'm in the middle of reading it now and it's a lot of fun. So uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell icon and you will be notified when my next review comes out. Thanks as always to my patrons for supporting the channel. You guys are awesome and you really keep this whole thing going.
Thanks a lot, everybody. I'll see you guys later.